Hello, and welcome to our program, Can't Stop, Won't Stop the Search for Relief. Searching, scratching the surface of itch and inflammation in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. I'm Dr. Michael Blaze, clinical professor of pediatrics at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. And I'm excited tonight be being joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. James Sublett. Thanks, Michael. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm the uh, current um, CMO of Family Allergy and Asthma in Louisville, and also the clinical professor of pediatric allergy and immunology at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. And you can see our faculty disclosures are, dis are displayed on the screen. So our two live Facebook, uh, Facebook live sessions about improving the management of, a of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis in our patient population. Now you can find the first Facebook live session on the Integrity Continuing Medical Education Facebook page, as well as Twitter and, fa and YouTube plus tutorials on this topic on Twitter on the handle at at so me CME. That's S-O-M-E-C-M-E. -E. Now, over the course of today's discussion, we'll be addressing the following learning objectives. One is to devise a strategy to incorporate emerging biologic monoclonal antibodies and Janus kinase inhibitors into treatment plans as they become available to appropriate selected patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And our second learning objective is to interpret the endpoint results from phase three clinical trials comparing the biologic dupilumab with JAK inhibitors. Now, today's conversation is going to focus on treatment. So Dr. Sublett, let's start with a brief discussion on the available options first for our patients with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as, as most of you know who've uh, in clinical practice, we've had very um, similar treatments for many years for atopic dermatitis. Basically, uh, the concept of keeping the skin moist by soaking baths, uh, using emollients uh, after bathing, uh, for the non, um, for the patients who really didn't have active disease, uh, that should be done on a regular basis. With mild to uh, um, getting into moderate, uh, we would um, uh, do that. Plus, uh, you know, certainly avoid triggers like wool and other triggers, allergic triggers that could aggravate the uh, disease. Uh, adding in topical um, corticosteroids, and then some of the newer treatments we have, like uh, the. Uh, topical, all topical uh, with the uh, calcernium inhibitors uh, and um, the uh, PDE4 inhibitor that is available for topical use. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's great now to have at least some options now instead of just topical cortical steroids, but the calcineurin inhibitors, and as you mentioned, something like Crisoboro, the, the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, I think uh, that's great. But unfortunately, as we know, uh, there are many of the patients that we take care of, in fact, that unfortunately those treatments will not get their condition under control. So now uh, what we'd like to do before we examine the different therapeutic options in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis is let's talk a little bit uh, about how we establish whether a treatment is working for our patients and how do we assess this uh, in clinical studies and in clinical practice? So what we're gonna look at first is look at some of the ways that we can then um, monitor our patients uh, in, with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and specifically with some of the measures uh, that are used in clinical studies when new treatments are being developed for patients with moderate to severe atopic uh, dermatitis. So what we have here is assessing paritis in patients uh, with atopic dermatitis. 
And this is using the peak paritis numerical rating scale. So this is used in lots of clinical studies. It's something that you could also use in your practice situation. And it asks the question, on a scale of one to 10, with zero being no itch and 10 being the worst itch imaginable, how would you rate your itch at the worst moment during the previous 24 hours? So this has been shown to be a well-defined, very reliable and sensitive scale. It's been shown to be valid in several uh, different ways in different studies for evaluating the worst itch intensity. And what's interesting to look at is changes in score. In fact, it's been shown to highly correlate with other itch patient-related outcome measures and moderately correlates with clinician-reported measures of objective signs of atopic dermatitis. As we'll see in some studies in just a few minutes, what's thought to be a true clinical response using the scale is at least a four-point decrease. So clinically relevant decrease would be four points. So let's say the patient started with a nine and went down to three. So that's a six point change. So that would be definitely a clinical response. Another very important scale is the eczema area and severity index. And this is made up of several aspects of trying to get a, a true measure of the amount of the body that's covered with eczema and the severity. So you select a body region, you assess the extent of the eczema in that body region, and then you assess the severity of each of the four signs in that body region, which is erythema, edema, papulation, excoriation, and lichenification. And a score goes from zero to being the worst would be 72. And in most studies, uh, most studies you'll see with patients with moderate to severe disease, they're going to have scores of at least in, in the high 20s to 30 range in the particular studies. And what we'll see is usually what's looked at as studies is how much improvement is there in the easy score. Uh, most clinical studies look at a 75% improvement. And something that you can use in your office situation, which is also used in almost every clinical study looking at treatments for atopic dermatitis, and that is the Validated Investigators Global Assessment for Atopic Dermatitis. And you can see here it scored from zero being clear to four being severe. And you can see on the slide the different morphologic description. And in most clinical studies, uh, it, what they're looking at is what percent of patients on a particular treatment go to zero to one or clear or almost clear and usually in studies with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, there has to be at least a two point change. And then very importantly, and something a lot of times we don't think about with atopic dermatitis, is that patients in fact truly have skin pain. At one time it was thought that patients obviously have severe pruritus and itch and they scratch, and then they in fact have elements of, of these things like painful, throbbing, biting, stinging, um, burning sharp, as you can see. But this very interesting study that was published in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology back in 2017 looked at patients describing skin pain that did have significant scratching, but also, as you can see in the light green here, uh, no or mild scratching. And yet, they were still having this symptomatology. So what we now really understand is that skin pain is a completely separate thing than itching and is seen in our patients, especially with moderate to severe atopic uh, dermatitis. So, so with that, uh, let's take a closer look at specific atopic dermatitis therapy options. Dr. Sublick, uh, would you like to start for us? Sure, sure, Michael. Uh, like to, uh, you know, first just we're gonna talk about the um, uh, biologics we have, the monoclonal antibodies uh, uh, have been both approved, uh, dupiplumab, diplomab, and uh, uh, nemalizumab and uh, Uh The uh, the uh, dupiplumab we've had now since 2017, uh, as we know, it's a human monoclonal antibody. Um, it inhibit, inhibits uh, through blocking IL-4 and IL-13, inhibits the uh, uh, type two cytokines uh, that lead to the uh, pro-inflammatory responses we see in atopic dermatitis. Um, the uh, studies, uh, uh, next slide, Michael. 
So uh, the uh, studies that have been done with uh, the filamab, um, uh, most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, the uh, classic study that was uh, published in uh, Lancet, uh, uh, the Liberty Ed Kronos study, and then also a study that was published in the New England Journal. Uh, the, uh, the slides here show, um, and I'm not sure, there's, there's a blue over, I'm not sure if that's still up there, Michael, if everybody can see that or just me. Um, there's a... Okay, so the uh, just looking at week 16, uh, which was one of the primary endpoints, uh, they looked at the um, uh, three different um, measures, the uh, IGA that Michael was mentioning earlier, the EASI 75 and the PPNRS. And in all three of those um, uh, measures, the, uh, uh, the Pilomap therapy shows statistical significance uh, over the um, uh, placebo in these studies. Uh, and actually, as you, if you look at the uh, blue lines here, the blue bars, that is a 300 milligram uh, weekly. Uh, it's important to note that these studies were done with um, uh, add-on uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the um, uh, moderate uh, potency uh, uh, topical steroids. Uh, so the both the um, uh, 300 milligrams and the 300 milligrams every week and every two weeks show statistical significance. And you can see there was very little difference between the, the purple bar uh, and the blue bar, which um, showed that the Q2 week was uh, uh, equally eff efficacious. Um, the uh, second study indicated here is the uh, study published by Simpson et al. in the New England Journal. Uh, showing very similar findings. Next slide. The uh, next slide indicates the uh, uh, efficacy of treatment across different subgroups of patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, this will be a uh, bill slide. Uh, the first slide shows the um, uh, these these were broken down into uh, three categories, a total of 2,058 patients. Uh, again, they looked at uh, the ASAI, the NRS, the DLQI, and I'll show you those in just a second. Uh, there were 1,429 patients in the uh, white wing of the study, uh, 501 in the Asian wing, and a much smaller number, only 128 blacks. Uh, which led to uh, more a uh, less statistical uh, statistical significance in the black population in these studies uh, they were treated again with uh, the, the pilomab uh, every two weeks and weekly uh, and uh, you can see the breakdown here on the dlqi uh, it favors the uh, statistically significant in, in both the white and asian populations and trending towards statistical significance in the uh, black population. Next slide. Uh, the NRS, similar findings um, with uh, significance in both the white and Asian. Uh, again, because of smaller populations likely uh, uh, trending uh, toward uh, uh, the, in the black population. Uh, next slide. The IGA. Um, Again, the uh, this investor global investigator global assessment, uh, uh, similar findings. These in this particular uh, slide, the uh, categories are reversed. So favors DUP is on the right hand side, uh, and you can see that in all three situations, again except for the black population, or statistical significance. Uh, we're not sure because of the way this study was powered whether this is uh, there is a racial difference, but the authors felt it was likely due to the uh, the, the differences in the population sizes of the uh, studies. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, with the uh, eczema area and severity index, very similar uh, outcomes. So uh, in all these uh, studies, the, uh, the Pilomab treatment uh, across different racial subgroups did show uh, either statistical or trending towards significance uh, in, in uh, the um, favor of the, uh, the pilomab 
with the uh, uh, caveat that because of the power of the study in the black population, there may be um, uh, some racial uh, differences in that population that we can't really tease out based on this study. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the, uh, the nimalimbozumab uh, topical study that was uh, just published uh, this year uh, in the New England Journal back in uh, July, I believe. And you can see again, uh, th this, this study looked at uh, mean change in the pruritus uh, at versus baseline. All these studies look at baseline. And you can see again the uh, pruritus uh, score at baseline at, uh, at 16 weeks um, was statistically significant over placebo uh, and percent change dropping by 34% versus 15% uh, percent in the placebo group. Uh, so all both these um, new uh, drugs, both the uh, uh, nimalizumab and the um, uh, trelakinumab, uh, the block IL-31, look very promising. IL-31 plays a significant role uh, in pruritus. Uh, but I think, uh, as we're going to talk about, there may be other options that we'll have uh, that may be um, also um, uh, uh, important. But finally, um, uh, the trelakinumab, um, Looking at the slide here uh, shows again at the um, uh, 300 milligram dose uh, every two weeks versus placebo statistical significance. Uh, uh, this was um, uh, uh, and again another study that just shows that uh, these three drugs do have uh, probably will have a role in the future as we uh, add them to our armamentarium in treating um, uh, atopy moderate to severe atopy dermatitis. Both the uh, latter two drugs are now in phase three and up for FDA approval. Michael? Yeah. So, so in addition to the biologic uh, monoclonals that Dr. Subley just went over, uh, there are several uh, JAK inhibitors that are being evaluated at this time for their therapeutic uh, potential in, in phase three study. So what I'd like to do first here is kind of go over uh, the, the mechanism uh, of action uh, of JAK inhibitors. And I think it's very important to realize that there's a family uh, uh, of JAK kinase, uh, JAK kinase 1, JAK Janus kinase 2, 3, and tyrosine kinase 2. And again, these are extremely important uh, for activation of a particular cell when, in fact, say an interleukin like IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, as we've heard about, uh, bind to a particular receptor site. When that happens, then it activates uh, these enzymes. Um, we'll just do an example, say JAK1. And then that leads to, very importantly, the dimerization and phosphorylation of the STAT protein. So the STAT protein, which is the signal transducer and activators of transcription, is extremely important because it crosses the cytoplasm into the nucleus and then uh, attaches to DNA for transcription and then does the particular activity uh, that that interleukin tells that cell to, uh, to do. So obviously an agent that blocks that, which we're talking about here, JAK inhibitors, would turn off this inflammatory response. And so that's the, the basis behind their activity in the treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So there are three that are in that are uh, finishing up or have finished phase three studies uh, in the United States. Uh, Abracitinib, which is a JAK1 inhibitor that's at two doses, 100 and 200 milligrams daily. Upadacitinib, which is also a JAK1, 15 to 30 milligrams daily. And baricitinib, which is a JAK1, JAK2 at one or two milligrams daily. Now, very important to point out, and in contrast to the biologics, these are oral tablets that are given that are given once a day. So let's look at some of the data uh, from the from the phase uh, from the phase three study. So first, we'll look at abracitinib, and this was monotherapy, so there was no topical cortical steroid use, just the agent or placebo in patients. Um, uh, 13 years of age and older with moderate to severe at atopic uh, dermatitis. So if you look all the way over to the right, the investigator global assessment, so going to zero to one with at least a two-point improvement, 
You see significant improvement with both doses of abracitinib, the 200 and 100. This was a 12-week study. And you can see that, uh, again, it was significantly better with the 200 versus the 100 dose, but both were significant. And then if we move in the middle, we have the easy 75, what proportion of patients got a 75% improvement in their easy score. And again, you see both doses of abracitinib, the 100 200 showed significant improvement over placebo, again, with the 200 showing a superior improvement. And then the last has to do with the peak paritis numerical rating scale. And again, what we see here is a significant improvement with both doses of, of abracitinib, 200 better than 100. The other thing I'd like to point out on, on this particular slide is you'll notice that at two weeks, uh, both doses of, of abracitinib were significantly better than placebo as far as getting a response as far as the peak paritis. Uh, the next agent is upadacitinib, another JAK1 inhibitor. And this one, they did use topical cortical steroids. And they looked, again, at improvement in patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And again, they used the three measures that we've been talking about, the EZ75, the investigator global assessment, 01, and improvement in the worst paritis, the numerical rating scale of four points or greater. And what you'll notice here is that both doses, the upadacitinib, the 30 and the 15 showed significant improvement compared to placebo uh, in this particular study. And again, the higher dose showed somewhat better response than what one saw in the lower dose. And the next agent, which is baricitinib, uh, again, another study looking at patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, again, two different doses versus placebo. And if we look at the primary endpoint, which it was the easy 75 score, the percent of the patients that showed a 75% improvement in their easy score compared to baseline, it was significantly better in the two milligram dose. The one milligram dose in this particular measure did not make statistical significance compared to placebo. Though both doses made significant improvement in the, in, the investigator's global assessment, zero one, and also, in the numerical rating scale of a four point improvement uh, or greater. So, so one of the questions that I think naturally arises when we look at this data, uh, that hopefully in the future we'll have multiple options for our patients now with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So Dr. Sublett, how do these treatments compare the JAK inhibitors versus the monoclonal uh, antibodies as far as efficacy and safety? Dr. Sublett. Thank you, Michael. Uh, okay. So we we all, I think, in clinical practice, uh, appreciate if head-to-head -head studies are done. Um, and in this case, we do have uh, just uh, completed a phase three head-to-head -head clinical trial looking at um, abracitumab and uh, dipilumab uh, versus placebo. Uh, and uh, the announcement of this occurred back earlier this year. Um, the, uh, so this was a, um, a phase three trial of abracitumab uh, for moderate to severe uh, atopic dermatitis. Uh, uh, the safety and efficacy um, uh, versus uh, in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, with uh, background uh, topical therapy, as we've been discussing in some of the other trials I mentioned earlier, uh, these studies are done uh, by add-on to uh, the usual um, moderate uh, cort uh, topical corticosteroid therapy. Um, and they also, uh, which I think is very important, uh, concluded a active control uh, arm using dupilumab, which as we've already shown, to, has been shown to be uh, quite effective uh, in atopic dermatitis control. Um, and then in this, in this uh, the primary outcome, again, using uh, the IGA uh, with a greater than two uh, point improvement from the baseline and also looked at the EASI 75. 
Um, and they, uh, the pro, they had a co-primary uh, efficacy endpoint. Uh, and at week 12, again, you're looking at week 12, uh, it was found that the, um, the uh, abrocitinib uh, was statistically significant uh, by placebo. That's important to point out that this is an oral um, drug. And when you looked at this compared to dupilumab, uh, the active control uh, primary endpoint uh, also uh, demonstrated a superiority to placebo. But uh, one important thing they looked at in this uh, situation was uh, they looked at the two weeks uh, of uh, clinical itching, and they showed that uh, the uh, uh, abrocitumab was actually superior uh, to um, uh, dupilumab at that two-week uh, interval. Um, it was uh, numerically higher, but not uh, statistically significant for the lower dose at 100 milligrams. So the 200 milligram dose was superior, but not the 100 milligram dose. Uh, so I think this is very important to show that we have a, uh, a, a um, uh, alternative, if you will, uh, especially with an oral dose uh, uh, compared to the pilumab uh, in these patients. Um, the uh, second, uh, uh, the lower part of this graph shows uh, the uh, the uh, heads up study of uh, the uh, of patacitumab, uh, your patacitumab, and uh, currently there's not been findings yet. It's a similar type study, but it should be completed uh, at the end of this year, and we'll have findings probably early next year. Uh, so, Michael, I think that with that, uh, we should probably go ahead and and uh, uh, move on to the next uh, part of our discussion. Um, if you have anything added uh, to what I've just discussed here about this head-to-head -head type of trial. No, I think that's, that's fine. Why don't, why don't we spend a few minutes, I'll let you start, because um, we didn't talk about side effect profile, and I think obviously everyone would be interested. So uh, anything related to the, to the uh, either dupilumab or the other uh, biologics that have not yet been approved but are in phase three for atopic dermatitis? Well, I think that's one thing we uh, uh, are concerned about, especially with biologics uh, that are currently available, whether there could be a, a possibility of secondary infections. Um, I don't think we really have enough data uh, on the uh, on the JAK uh, uh, impact yet on, on this, but I think the um, that's always a question. Uh, to date, we have not seen much of that, but I think with water use, we may be uh, uh, concerned. Uh, do you have anything to add related to the um, some of the newer ones we've been discussing tonight? Sure. Um, so, so as far as the JAK inhibitors, you know, uh, what's been seen with the studies uh, in atopic dermatitis so far has been very reassuring. It appears to be the, the typical side effects that we see in lots of clinical studies, things like headaches and increased upper respiratory tract infection because you have to report everything that happens to the patient. Uh, and there seems to be, at least in some of the studies, there may be some increased GI problems, nausea or diarrhea, but this doesn't seem to be a problem as far as patients uh, having to stop uh, the therapy. Uh, a lot of this may be related that, again, many of these agents are already approved for rheumatologic conditions at higher doses, and there has been the theoretical concern of the possibility of secondary infections um, uh, and also effect on hemopoiesis, which it doesn't really seem to be showing up in the, uh, in the uh, clinical studies. Uh, there have been some reports, uh, again, primarily in the rheumatologic literature related to a herpes reactivation with these particular agents. But I think if one looks at, and there was a recent network meta-analysis of uh, 39 randomized controlled trials that, or have, that have looked at these different uh, systemic immunomodulatory treatments for atopic dermatitis. So this included the JAK inhibitors, this included the biologics, that many of the studies only reported one event or zero events, and again, there appears to be that both the biologics and the JAK inhibitors fear, fear at this point in time from what we know seem to be very safe uh, in the treatment of, uh, of atopic dermatitis. 
So based on everything we discussed tonight, the biologics that we've talked about, the JAK inhibitors, again, I think they appear to be poised to really play an important role in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. So what type of guidance, uh, Jim, would you give our audience in terms of strategies for incorporating uh, these treatments for appropriate patients when they do become available? Well, I think, I think one thing that we uh, probably under, underestimate the um, morbidity and, and um, quality of life uh, challenges these patients have. And um, as these uh, treatment modalities have become available, I, I tend to uh, speak to the more to my patients about just how they feel, their, their general overall um, quality of life. And I think uh, it, it, this is very similar to early, uh, that reminds me of, of you know, 20, 25 years ago with asthma when we had new uh, uh, treatment modalities come along for asthma, including the early biologics. Uh, and as time has passed, we now are much more likely to uh, look at uh, these patients, not only just based on their lung function, but uh, but how they're doing clinically. And I think the same thing applies, and maybe more so to HLV dermatitis, because as you know, we don't have really many objective findings. There's no magic um, uh, outside of these uh, these uh, things we mentioned that we can use to assess how the patients are doing. But some just sometimes just asking the patient, especially about the pain, I think that's something that we probably have not really considered in the past. And in talking to patients, I had a patient I saw today that's on uh, the Pilomav in my office. Of course, it's the only one currently approved, and he's doing quite well. And I uh, asked him about, uh, did he have pain before? And he really, he said, well, yes, you know, I did. And he probably had, uh, uh, you know, it, we, he was mainly on the, the, pil the Pilomav for his asthma that had concurrent HW dermatitis, which as we discussed in the first phase of this, that's a very common comorbidity. Um, and he said he did have pain, but his asthma, he was so focused on his asthma that his, he kind of was, um, uh, didn't think as much about or didn't talk about the, uh, the problem with his atopy dermatitis. But now that he's got resolution, um, actually more dramatic resolution with his uh, atopy dermatitis, uh, his asthma is doing well too. But uh, he, you know, it's really been, a, uh, he, he used the term uh, life changing to him. And I think with these new treatments, we just went through them. We have uh, uh, better control of itching, which is, uh, 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 as was shown in the last uh, session, uh, the uh, degree of itching can lead to the pain, but people have pain beyond it, just the itching. Uh, the, all of that uh, will be much better controlled. I think it's exciting to have a possibility of an oral uh, therapy that we can use, um, especially uh, showing that in this head-to-head -head study that the um, itching uh, was brought under control so rapidly I think within two weeks, uh, superior to head-to-head uh, uh, -head with the Pilomab that we know has had um, a good um, record since it was approved uh, three years ago. So I think it's very exciting to have uh, a menu, if you will, uh, where we can actually do um, uh, you know, personalized medicine for these patients. Absolutely agree. And I, I think that uh, uh, it's nice to be able to have uh, different therapies uh, for our patients that suffer with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And I think what we'll end up doing, much like uh, you mentioned here, I think we'll be doing a lot of shared decision making uh, with the patients related to uh, biologics and, and JAK inhibitors and trying to not only uh, obviously to get their condition under control, but make sure that uh, it's a treatment that they would be adherent to and, and agreed to, uh, to use. So to understand the, the benefits and the risk, all of those issues. So uh, I think uh, we'll be able to do even a better job with our patients with atopic dermatitis in the, in the near future. So, so this brings us to the end uh, of our discussion. So let me just summarize what we talked about. And that is targeting cytokines has emerged as an important therapeutic strategy in the treatment of patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Although only dupilumab is currently FDA approved for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, other biologics and several JAK inhibitors have shown good efficacy and safety and are now in late stage clinical development. 
And patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis will soon have access to an expanded range of treatments that can significantly improve the management of their disease. So Dr. Sublett, before we end, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to say to our audience? Well, I, Michael, I appreciate being involved and, and I think we all see these patients. Um, and as I mentioned just a minute ago, I think it's really important that we, uh, we do discuss uh, the morbidity, mortality, uh, not, excuse me, not mortality, but life uh, um, impact that these uh, people have in their day-to-day -day lives, uh, especially the, uh, the um, quality of life issues. And I think with these new exciting therapies we have, that we should be able to have dramatic um, uh, impact on improving their lives. So uh, I think, you know, if, they, if you have patients coming in with atopic dermatitis, discuss their issues with them and, and offer them these therapies. Yeah, I think that uh, we have to have a lot of empathy for these patients. They really do suffer. Uh, there are significant uh, morbidities associated with this condition that we discussed in the first uh, Facebook Live session. And again, it's exciting to have uh, more new treatments, hopefully in the near future, for our patients. Uh, so to you, our audience, John, I want to thank you for joining Dr. Sublett and me. Uh, please make sure, though, that you claim your CME credits by completing the post-test and evaluation form at integrityce.com slash AD post test and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.